<laughs> okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the most crowded prep I've ever seen, <laughs> I must say. Uh, probably if somebody has a camera should take a picture of this. This doesn't happen very well. Yeah, okay. <laughs> everybody has a camera. <laughs> Great. So, welcome everybody. Uh, today, on this very, very busy day, we are going to have two speakers. First, we start with Joe, uh, Jody Pascal, who is, of course, our own. Uh, and he has been doing excellent work in the, uh, for Chandra X-ray Center. And, of course, he has made many of the beautiful Chandra images, and, uh, uh, Chandra images in the past. After Joe's talk, who is going to talk about the art and science of image processing, we're going to continue with Peppy, who is going to tell us about all kinds of secrets about elliptical galaxies, what we have learned along the way. Uh, I hope there will be some secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joe, please. Okay. Well, thanks for that introduction, and uh, thanks everyone for coming. It's really great to see such a huge crowd here. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say, before I get started, a half hour is definitely not enough time to like, really explain what I do, so if there's a lot of interest, like maybe talk about doing a workshop at some point. I would love to do that. So the Office of Communication and Public Engagement here from Chandra is we have quite a team of people. Um, if you came to Peter's talk last month, you probably recognize some of these names. Uh, it's led by Kathleen Listition and um, Peter Wallace and Megan take care of the, the press portions of our press releases, the, the write-ups and everything. And then there's a large team of talented people for the web and multimedia and imaging support, including myself. Uh, science imagery. <clears throat> so that team is responsible for not only our, our print materials, but also the layout, design, and content of the public-facing Chandra website here. Um, this is where our press releases go out every, every, roughly every two weeks. And it's also, you know, it's a resource for the public, but it's also a resource for you as well. If you find yourself uh, doing a public talk and you need slides with images of the Chandra telescope or any of the press releases that we've done over the last 15 years, they're all right here on the website. They're all searchable. There's many sections uh, devoted to well, all right, it's, it's that. Uh, sections devoted to uh, resources for scientists and multimedia. There's a lot of videos and images that are really useful for uh, public talks. And tying into what I'm talking about today, there's actually a section that I designed uh, called Open Fits where it's a, a tutorial on how to create press quality images using Chandra data. And we just updated it a few months ago to include multi-wavelength multi data as well. Um, and so that uses, uh, the tutorial is designed to use uh, open source uh, software like GIMP, uh, so you don't have to spend any money with Photoshop or any of the software that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, the tutorial is designed for open source. <coughs> And also to get you started, there's some great papers just to take a look at. Um, back in 2007, Travis Rector et al. had this paper uh, on image processing techniques for creating uh, press imagery. And it really goes in depth into the, the fundamentals and the philosophy of how to create effective public imagery uh, from astronomical data. And then more recently, uh, last year, Lars Christensen et al. released this paper um, on the communicating astronomy with the public journal on sort of quantifying what determines the aesthetic qualities of astronomical images. And uh, this is a great paper just to give you a sense of what we think about in this field uh, when we're putting images together. So what do I do? So as I said, the website is a resource for you as well. I'd like to you consider me a resource as well. My office is always open. If you ever have questions about your own data, your own images, feel free to drop by and ask questions. Um, I am here if you have press release material to help you make the most of your data and the story. So we can take an image like this. This is a NZ210 press release from 2010. Uh, this was the image provided by the author, which is a nice looking image. Um, the resulting image that we did the press release on is this. Now that is a little unfair because that also adds in the x-ray data that wasn't in the previous version. Uh, we have a lot of images that have contour maps in them, and we can take something like this and turn it into something like this. The cat's eye, maybe. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Arguably a, a nice looking image. So really what it's all about is maximizing the aesthetic quality and balancing that out with the science behind the image. 
who could argue that the gummy Venus de Milo is not an aesthetically pleasing one? <laughs> and uh, Kim has led a study called Aesthetics and Astronomy over the last few years, where we've done surveys of the general public on what their what their ideas of astronomical imagery are, what they find appealing and not, and how they understand the images just based on the image that's captioned. And we use the results of this uh, to inform the decisions that we make when creating press imagery. So here's an example of an image in its almost raw state. This is from a press release that we did back in December last year. This is uh, NGC 2207, and what I've done here is shown you the optical uh, HST image. This is not exactly raw data because this is a merged data set of uh, two or three different width pit pointings. And then I've overlaid in the most raw state that I can the Chandra data. It's already it's zoomed in to match the scale size of the uh, HST. Um, <coughs> and I did choose the color as well. But then I can blend this in with what we've done when we release the image, the choices that we make. Um, most noticeably, you probably see the smoothing of the X-ray. Right, you can also see the, the choice of cropping, which is to just maximize the amount of the optical image without bringing in any of the uh, unsightly edges. And then, of course, the x-ray data have been smoothed, uh, in this case, using adaptive smoothing, which I'll talk about in a minute. So this is just an indication of some of the choices that we make when we're going from the raw data into the final version of the image. And in this case, there's actually a Another data set here, the uh, dust lanes here maybe look like they're glowing red. That's because there's Spitzer data, Spitzer data in this image as well. So if you look at those papers that I mentioned before, the Travis Rector and the Lars Christensen, some of the core qualities that they, they talk about in their papers of what makes an effective public image include the resolution of the image. And in the Christensen paper, uh, they they call this the photogenic resolution of the image, and that is the fineness of details that you can resolve across the field of view of the image. Um, the higher that degree of fineness is, the better the image really looks. And then tied to that is the high signal to noise. Um, you want to have a really good signal. You don't want to see a lot of noise in an image. So <coughs> smoothing routines become important, specifically with x-ray data. Uh, cleaning of artifacts, and this is a, an issue that we face a lot with um, HST images in particular, there's a lot of cosmic ray hits, there's a lot of nasty noise in these images, and we don't want to put that out there. It's confusing for the public. They may think there's alien spaceships or something. <laughs> uh, choices of color and contrast, and then finally composition. In, in these last few, we're thinking in terms of not only science, but also as a photographer or, or an artist, how would you want this image to look in its most aesthetically pleasing way? And then moving into some of the processing concepts that I use when I'm working on images. Um, starting with image integration, for me, an x-ray that mainly involves using Chow, a little bit of IDL. Uh, so I do use Chow for merging data sets for doing large, large images. Um, <clears throat> image smoothing I do in IDL, but then also other routines as well. And then image delinearization is just taking the image and moving it from a linear fits image into a nonlinear scaled image that then can be imported into image processing software. Uh, high dynamic range is, is sort of taking that delinearization a step further and compressing the dynamic range of the image. So you want to take the, the, the highest the peak brightness and the, the faintest features and sort of compress them so that you can see them all simultaneously. Um, you see this a lot in photography now. It's become a very popular thing. Especially if you have an iPhone, there's actually a button on there. When you're taking a picture, you can change it to HDR mode. And it'll try to do that for you. It'll see what's the brightest and dimmest part, part, parts of your image and compress them so that you can resolve details in both the brightest and dimmest regions. Color choice and cropping and composition then, um, that comes into play with software that I use, PixInsight and, and Photoshop. And then, of course, I just added on this metadata part because I can't um, emphasize its importance enough. Um, putting proper metadata into the final versions of images allows us to do much more with them down the line. And this is slightly unfair because in the PixInsight software that I use, uh, I can do almost everything in this entire uh, routine all within PixInsight. Whether or not I choose to depends on the image that I'm working on. So smoothing, I'm going to skip the image integration part because I'm going to assume that most of you are familiar with Chow and how to merge images. Uh, but 
moving into image smoothing, adaptive smoothing is one routine that we use to make effective uh, public imagery from x-rays. And so this is an example of smoothing uh, the antennae galaxies <coughs> image that I'm going to show a little later. Uh, adaptive smoothing is an adaptive kernel smoothing algorithm that preserves point sources but smooths out low signal to noise regions. Um, and it does a very nice job of specifically in this case taking things that look like gas clouds and actually making them look like gas clouds. Now there's a balance there. You have to give it uh, one of the inputs to a smooth is the signal to noise of the image. And if you can play around with it a little bit, but you don't want to over smooth it because you can introduce artifacts that aren't there, that aren't really there. And of course under smoothing it won't take care of some of the noise that you want to get rid of. So there is a balance there. Is there a typical value that you use? I usually use around three. It's the square root of like the, the median. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> the balance is important for a smoothing. Um, <clears throat> another smoothing routine that I use is called restoration. This is similar to a smooth, only that it's a contour preserving smoothing algorithm. So it's looking for brightness contours in an image and trying to preserve those. Uh, so here's just an example of a uh, an ideal sphere with some noise added in the middle panel is where restoration has smoothed that image and the red panel is the, uh, the non-noisy image. Uh, and then a real example here with N132D, supernova right in. Um, <clears throat> this middle panel is C smooth, again like A smooth. Uh, so it's an adaptive smoothing versus restoration, which and in this case I think it does a really good job of taking a noisy x-ray image from Chandra on the, the left and preserving most of that structure and just sort of smoothing over some of the noise lower signal to noise regions. And again, one of the most important things is that we don't want to over-smooth because we want to show off the angular resolution of Chandra. It's so amazing, we don't want to smooth over that. So finding that balance is really important. <clears throat> Moving on to intensity scaling, I'm just going to quickly mention Fitz Liberator. This is uh, free software that if you just Google Fitz Liberator, you can find the link to download it quickly. Um, this is the interface for Fitz Liberator. It allows you to quickly scale an image and convert it from a linear Fitz image to a nonlinear uh, TIFF or JPEG image format that you would then import into the image processing software. So I'm not going to go into the details of that. <coughs> yourself. Um, PixInsight is what I use mostly when I'm working on images, and PixInsight has some very nice uh, <coughs> routines. It's, it was, it's basically like Photoshop, but it was designed by and for astronomers. It's used mainly in the amateur astrophotography community. But it has some really great algorithms that are designed to maximize uh, the signal and potential of astronomical images. One of the things that's really great about PixInsight is there's this tool called the screen transfer function. It allows you to do a nonlinear transformation to the image without actually affecting the pixels. So it's just rendering it to the screen without doing anything to the data. And that affords you the opportunity to do certain image processing algorithms on the image without, um, without having to stretch it first. So that gives you uh, some additional uh, play in what you can do before you stretch it. And then when you are ready to stretch the image, this is the, the tool that we use, the histogram transformation tool, which may seem a little foreign to some of you because it doesn't really give you the option of doing like a logarithmic stretch, but you, you have complete control over the midtones transfer, the black point and the white point, uh, directly from this tool, and it's allowing you to see the histogram of the image while you're doing that. The high dynamic range processing that I was talking about, in PixInsight, it uh, uses a wavelets-based approach. And that, the wavelets allow you to isolate certain scale size features of the image. So zooming into the core of this M51 image, uh, I've done a wavelets processing to isolate structures at four pixels or less. And that's what this image is. And I went back and did the same processing for 32 pixels or less. So you can see how that's giving you a sense of what, what features and what structures are there at different scale sizes. And the tools that utilize uh, wavelets in, in PixInsight allow you to separate the image out into those different scale sizes and perform operations on them individually and then combine them back together. So in the case of HDR, there's an HDR wavelets tool that allows you to do this and essentially turn off this uh, brightness cast in the, the core of the galaxy. Like that. In Photoshop, there is a trick to using HDR. Uh, 
It's called Open as Camera Raw, and I'm actually going to try and demonstrate this now in real time. You are courageous. <laughs> so I can go into Photoshop and click on this TIFF image. <clears throat> and down here under Format, I can have a, a, a selection of different formats to open it as. And if I choose Camera Raw, there's a, a whole separate software suite that Photoshop includes that's independent of the soft, of, of the usual Photoshop interface. And from here, you have control over these sliders that allow you to adjust things like clarity, which is essentially HDR. It's compressing um, contrast in different regions. And then there's a lot of exposure controls here. And there's also a very powerful smoothing algorithm, uh, noise reduction, going here. It's just a slider. So I find this to be useful, but at the same time difficult, because it's hard to reproduce what I've done. <laughs> but once I've opened the image here, all those settings are saved and now the image is opened. And another way of doing HDR processing in Photoshop is to use image adjustments, HDR toning. And this is another tool that's it's all sliders based, and it's hard to reproduce what you've done, and it's not very easy to use. But when, when you get used to it, you start to really play around with it. You can see how um, Radius is essentially doing wavelets on this image, I'm choosing different scale sizes to emphasize when I do this. <laughs> Color and composition. These are getting into the last few stages of the, uh, the image. <clears throat> so this is an example of Antenna Galaxies image that we released in 2010. It started with this Hubble Space Telescope image, which is just a beautiful image, but it has a very full color range in it. And when we initially tried to add X-ray and infrared to it, although this is a beautiful image, there's something called color confusion going on here, where the blues from the original uh, HST image are now mixed in with the blues from the X-ray. So from a public relations standpoint, it's very confusing to say, you know, to, to talk about the colors in this image and to say X-rays in this image are blue. That's not entirely true because the x-rays are also optical in this image. So we take the optical image and reduce it down to one color, this gold color, and then bring in the x-rays in blue and the infrared and red. And now the colors are very clear. It's very easy to say anything that you see in this image that's yellow or gold it comes from the optical. Anything that's blue is x-ray, anything that's red is infrared. And now this is just something I, I'm, I want to explain for what I'm going to show in a few minutes. Um, the blending mode is the way that you layer images together in Photoshop. Uh, it's usually called screen. And what's going on under the hood is this mathematical equation. So you're just inverting the two images and then um, multiplying them and inverting them again. And this allows you to layer images together and see what's underneath. So this M106 image, I'm going to layer in X-ray, infrared, and then radio. And that's, that's what screen mode is. And now the reason that's important is I'm going to do a, uh, a little demo again of what I do in Pixit site using this image as an example. So it all started with this image, this whole space telescope image here. First, I'm just going to open that image and show you how it started. I really liked this image, but I didn't want to just reduce this down to one color like I showed with the antenna galaxy. So I wanted to try to preserve some color uh, from the original optical data. So what I did was, using Pixing Site, I can actually separate out the RGB channels with just one button. I'm going to turn off red, and now I'm going to rename these so it's easier to do operations than I'm going to do. So this is the green, this is the blue. And now I'm going to recombine them using a tool called Pixel Map in Pixel Site. I'm going to create a new image, and I'm going to make this a combination of green and blue, where the green channel of the image is now half green and half That was just a mistake. I have to change the color space to RGB so that it actually makes the color image. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So this then became the basis for the, the combination of X-ray and infrared radio. That's the, the optical image now. It has more than just a gold color to it. There's actually some real colors to this image. And now just to give you some insight into what the next step would be, um, since I was starting with an image from HST from a press release, there's no coordinate information in that image. And so there's actually tools in Fix Insight that can resolve the WCS for this image and write them into the fix header so that I can then uh, layer together all the other wavelengths that I want to do my final image. Do you start with a FITS image in this software, or do you start with a... You can start with a FITS image. In this case, I did not, but I will in a second. Um, in fact, this image here, this is an SDSS image that was a FITS image of the same region, and I used this as the basis for my WCS solution, finding matching stars and points in the images. There's a, um, a tool in FITS Insight, like an image analysis manual image solver, that will use those points that I just identified and write into the header of this image the coordinate information. It's header. There's the coordinates in that image. Makes it really easy. I know. Okay. The next, the final step then is to make the composite image. <laughs> So what I'm uh, loading up here is these are saved image uh, works, uh, work, workstations essentially. Uh, in this version here, I've got inf infrared on the top left, X-ray on the right, the optical image over there on the left, and the radio image down here on the right. Is that two minutes? Uh, so the reason they look so strange is because I've, I've solved them uh, so that I can just stack them together and I'll have my, my multi-wavelength image after that and they are sort of driven by the scale size of the infrared image, which is huge. So that's why they're not so small. So then after combining them, that's what I get. And so this is the pixel math um, uh, description of that image, basically. And the fractions here are just ways of generating different colors. Instead of just red, green, and blue, I can actually generate, you know, in x-ray, I have this sort of tealish blue color, and that's out of 255 for each color channel, I have a fraction. So that one is mostly blue, a little bit of green and some red. The infrared uh, is mostly red. The radio is a little bit of red and blue to give you purple. And almost done. So the last few slides here, I just wanted to show a couple of comparisons of images that we've done recently. Uh, this is an example uh, where this is the same exact data. <laughs> It's just the processing routines that I've used to, that makes them different. It's this one, mainly HDR processing, makes a difference here. Tyco Supernova Remnant, again, <laughs> same amount of data. The only difference between them is that the, the energy uh, bands are slightly different, so there's a little more red on the left side. And Cas A, again, same exact data set. Uh, down the left, you can really see the, a lot of the fainter structures come out and you can resolve a lot more detail. Thanks. <laughs>
I might have missed how, I mean, if you're, if you're starting with separate images from different observatories, how do you align and combine them? Just DS9 or? Uh, so the, 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 the example that I went through with M106, I sort of glossed over that a little bit. There's a tool in, in PixInsight that allows you to use the coordinate information from the Pix header to then make uh, images that are registered to each other and then stack them together. Yes? Which of these software is available? Let's say for it's another Which software? Or which of these, uh, either of these approaches is available? So, any moment you can call. Right, so the OpenFits tutorial that I mentioned in the beginning, that uses GIMP, which is an open source image processing software. And it steps you through all the processing routines needed to make a color image uh, from x-ray data or a multi-wavelength image as well. So that's something you could do right now. Go back and, and download GIMP if you don't already have it and make an image that way. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to shell out some money to buy either Photoshop or uh, PixInsight. Well, I had in mind, for example, a, a group license. So this is, I see this not as a what very helpful, and uh, one method that would make it really worth it. Yes, I would love to do that. <laughs> very short question. You you did the very nice tutorial for the open fits. Can you do a similar one that uses PixInsight? Because getting over the, the startup of PixInsight was actually kind of tricky. Yes. And once you got through that, it was okay. But Yeah, so PixInsight has a certain user interface that is Unique to fix this idea. Right. So, learning curve. so writing a tutorial that kind of just gets you, you know, walks you through fix insight would be just as useful. Sure. Yeah, you can do that. Martin, you have a Oh, I was just going to ask if you do actually get a surprise uh, from the scientists who show the, the thing too, do they say, oh, I didn't know that was there? Because <laughs> it seems like you should. That does happen very often. Yes. Right. So, <laughs> but that means we should be applying it to all the data above a certain signal to noise threshold so that. It's a problem that we make. Yeah. Okay, last question, if any. Well, I just, just a okay, comment. I mean, this is wonderful. And I think it really tells us on the science side that we need to have a good visualization tool or environment that people can use. The S9 has been the workhorse forever, but clearly this is yeah. much, much better. So. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, John. <laughs>
So this is uh, we're going to talk about some recent work and work that's already uh, that's happening right now, and uh, um, the originally the focus was to release it to question on measuring masses of elliptical galaxies, but this has also taken us into some different territory, and uh, this is uh, work done with a bunch of people. And uh, also, I want to say that this talk builds upon uh, last week's talk by Don Wood. Here. Um, okay, how do you model the mass of uh, uh, an elliptical galaxy? Well, basically, all the methods uh, are based on finding some suitable test particle. And if you're an optical astronomer, you would go and look at the motions of the stars, globular clusters, or planetary nebulae. And uh, if you're an X ray astronomer, you use the Hopp halo. And then from this, uh, you uh, model the potential. And uh, as X-ray astronomers, we've known this since the 70s, and uh, we've been battling with this for a few decades. But where are we now with Chandra? So uh, what I want to show you, make the case that uh, I think nowadays we X-ray measurement of masses are pretty solid. And uh, also, we are at the point that it's quite important to uh, compare different methods because they can tell us something about the galaxy. And I'm going to uh, use uh, NGC 4649, a giant Virgo elliptical, also known as M60. And here you see the Hubble picture, and I don't know if you can see it, but you have lots of dots of lights here, uh, which are the global clusters. So one of the markers for the gravitational potential. And here is Chandra. Uh, where you also have dots of lights, but those are X-ray binaries, low mass X-ray binaries, some of which are in globular cluster. And then you have this glow, which is the emission from the hot interstellar medium from which we can calculate uh, densities, we can calculate temperatures, and so forth. So here is the radial mass profile, the comparison from uh, um, um, using the x-rays. Um, so this is a mass within a radius versus the radius. In pale blue is the x-ray measurement by Alessandro. And uh, the colored lines are measurement based on optical markers. And you know, by and large, things work pretty well. They all follow each other, which is quite nice. There are some differences. One difference we note here in the inner region and it turns out this is the region where there is feedback in action. Um, so this is an X-ray image of the internal region, and those are the radio contours. So basically, the hot interstellar medium is not just feeling gravity, but it's also feeling a push from uh, this uh, feedback. And that explains this discrepancy. There is also a discrepancy at the outer radii. And well, could just be poor data down there of different methods. But quite interestingly, this is the region where if you look at the two-dimensional distribution of global clusters, and this is work by Raffaele da Brusco, who's done it for a few galaxies, we do find an interesting excess which suggests that maybe a satellite galaxy which has been disrupted and merging with um, NGC 4649. If this is the case, some of the motion are not just simply the re relaxed gravitational motion, but it's more complication in those radii. Okay, so the second point I wanted to make, for uh, when our data are worse, you know, the M60 I've showed you, this is beautiful data. 
But can we use X-ray emission, by which I mean X-ray luminosity, <coughs> as a quick proxy of mass? And how do we do that? And here there are two questions that were, you know, originated when we started looking with Einstein satellite and how much of the X-ray emission is from the hot halos, are the hot halos in equilibrium, that, you know, people have been uh, uh, debating of which Chandra all we have to do, and that's the beauty of high resolution, all we have to do is to look. And we can extract the halo, uh, we can see how its, uh, uh, its geography, its physical properties. Using this type of data, um, this is mostly work led by Don Wu, uh, we have derived scaling relation, relations of which Chandra for the various components of these galaxies. <coughs> and here is a summary. Basically, there is a linear relation between stellar luminosity, which is a proxy of stellar mass, and X-ray integrated X-ray luminosity of all these points of light, the X-ray binaries. And then there are two steep relations, of which the really good one is with, between the X-ray emission of the gas and the temperature, and the also X-ray emission of the gas and the optical luminosity. And so these are the relations I'm going to use next. I'm also uh, showing you this again that was shown by Dovu last week, and this shows that at least uh, for this small sample of galaxies, the X-ray luminosity of the gas, once it's been cleaned up of the X-ray binaries, it's correlated uh, very well with the total mass measured by independent pointers. Those are optical uh, pointers, planetary nebulas and global cluster kinematics. And, and it goes with a power law of exponent of three. So if you put this together with the uh, relation that we find between the, the gas luminosity and the gas temperature, you end up with an expression which is basically the degree of theory. So this tells you that uh, um, these halos are most likely realized, but what we don't know if uh, this realization, uh, halos in equilibrium, basically are a general property of the elliptical galaxies, there are only 14 points in this plot. And so that took us to a next step, uh, which is also the we'll talk about. And uh, the point I want just to show here is that out of this uh, study of the Atlas sample observed with Chandra, we find that for the elliptical galaxies, those, their internal core, their old stellar population, and uh, basically do not rotate, there is a very good tight relation between the, the X-ray emission of the hot gas and its temperature, again with exponent 4.5. Again, consistent with Realization. So, at least for these galaxies, I think we can do, uh, we can have a recipe how to measure the mass. So, first of all, we have to establish a solid X ray uh, scaling relation in the near universe, and we began to do this with Chandra. And I believe that someone like X ray surveyor would be great because we need to resolve the various components and get uh, a clean measure of the hot interstellar medium. Once we have that, we also we need to establish a solid relation between the luminosity of the gas and the total mass in the near universe. This can be done with X-rays, and again, you need very high quality data, or it can be done with kinematics. And this is work that we're, we're trying to, to do right now, in, some cases, in collaboration with some colleagues um, from Santa Cruz and other places. Now, Next, you need to have the structure of these galaxies. Well, that means you need a good resolution telescope, Hubble a 30 meter class, if you want to look at the surface brightness. Um, you have that, then you can observe in X-rays, and any old telescope will be okay. Athena is fine for this, it was it, um, anything. All you need is the, uh, just the integrated luminosity. Um, once you have that, you, you have the near uh, universe scaling relation, and you can use that to estimate the luminosity of the gaseous component, apply the mass relation, there you go, you got your mass. However, this is not true for all galaxies, because some galaxies, those are the rotating S0 type, the younger stellar population galaxies, 
well, do not have halos in equilibrium. Um, they might have winds, they might have a multi-phase interstellar medium, but one thing that they have, okay, is that they have fairly low luminosity of the gas. So one thing you can do is uh, ignore them. So if you, if, you, if you exclude this past galaxy statistically, so you don't look at anything that has a, a gas luminosity below, say, 10 to the 4 x per second, then you can go ahead and you can apply your relations and get a mass measurement. Now, all of this is based on scaling laws that are derived in the near universe. So the, the question here is how far in redshift can we go? Um, and we've been, we started looking at this question by using the data in uh, the Cosmos survey. Now, the Cosmos survey, in particular C Cosmos, is the Chandra, the original Chandra piece. It's a fairly wide area survey of the sky, which is multi wavelength. And uh, um, within uh, this C uh, Cosmos field, uh, there are about 6,500 early type galaxies, so ellipticals and F zeros. They're classified on the basis of their colors and optical spectra, and uh, non AGN and uh, a redshift uh, up to 1.5. Of these galaxies, 69 are detected, and they were studied in a paper, Francesca Civan is the first author, and then all the others are not detected, and those are part of a work that Alessandro Paggi is doing right now. Now, unfortunately, for this survey, we only have X-ray luminosity and, uh, say, K-band luminosity that we can use because the data quality does not allow us to measure the temperature of the gas. But again, you can think in the future with a much larger collecting area like Latina, X-ray survey will produce, we should be able to get those uh, temperatures and we should be able to use the relation with the gas temperature, which is a much tighter one. So what happens with these galaxies? What I'm plotting here is from the paper by Francesca, is the X-ray luminosity, and I'll tell you what this X-ray luminosity is in a moment, versus the K-band K -band luminosity. And the red points are the local universe points that the who is being studying, and these black points are the, black, are the points, uh, the 69 cosmos uh, detections. The X-ray luminosity here is the total detected X-ray luminosity, from which we have subtracted the contribution from X-ray binaries, low mass X-ray binaries, um, which is uh, we obtain using the near universe scaling laws and also considering the evolution of the binaries is a paper by Tasso Stragos for those at higher redshift. And of course, K-correction is applied throughout. Now, in pink is the, say, local universe relationship between gaseous emission and K-band luminosity, which goes with uh, a power of 4.5. Um, so we divided this plane into three strips, uh, a strip which is the extension of the local uh, universe relation, then uh, a region here of very luminous galaxies with emission above 10 to the 42 x per second, and then there is this gray green area where these are galaxies that if uh, clearly have, X, given their, their optical stellar luminosity, they have X-ray emission in excess of what the local strip, say, burial relation would predict. So those are the X-ray excess galaxies. Now, the galaxies, uh, uh, the, say the black points, <laughs> yeah, that's too bad. Okay, so the black points here, so the Cosmos galaxy uh, in the top, below 10 to the 42 hours per second, but in the top part of this uh, strip, um, are uh, mostly um, uh, nearby old stellar population ellipticals and uh, um, age, um, so redshift is less than 0.55, age is, is greater than 9 giga years for the stellar population. So in a way, they most likely have like 
the core ellipticals that have the realized halos, and maybe they belong to this strip. Um, the galaxy up there, um, they're higher redshift, and they have intermediate to old stellar population from nine, from five to nine uh, giga years. The galaxies in this kind of region here, really interesting because they're also high redshift, but they have younger stellar population, less than five giga year. So for these galaxies, there is clearly something else going on. We're not just talking about halos in equilibrium doing their X-ray emission. Um, there are two possibilities that come to mind. One is that they may have obscured nuclei. I'm showing here a near universe example. It's NGC 6240, where indeed there are two complete nuclei. This is a merger. Or uh, they may have enhanced halo luminosity, as we see in NGC 6240, because probably auto major activity. And if you look at the Hubble images of these galaxies, I mean, they're not great images, but they do show uh, near uh, a companion or distorted isotopes. So merging, it's probably something going on over there. Now, let's look at this green area. So one possibility is that we're dealing with galaxies where the, uh, quant the quantity of dark matter uh, compared to the quantity of stars is, for some reason, much larger. And so they have big X-ray halos. Is that true? So just to put it in a different geography, if we use the value scaling relation, this is what, where those galaxies will end up in a plane which is total mass versus stellar mass. And this blue area includes the local universe calibrator, those 14 galaxies that Don Moore was talking about. So, if you look at masses, these galaxies would have, say, here, a mass, total mass of, say, 10 to 12 suns, uh, when their stellar mass is something like, uh, so, sorry, is about 10 to the 10 suns, um, and they would have a similar mass to galaxies that have, have a stellar mass a factor of 10 or more larger. Um, so that suggests that maybe there is something else, and something else is AGN. We have subtracted the stellar contribution from the X-ray emission to calculate this X-ray luminosity. Um, but this is something that we can uh, also examine a bit more. And another point is here, we only deal with the 69 detection in Cosmos. So our coverage of this plane may be uh, rather sparse and maybe also biased. So that brings us to the new work that Alessandro is doing, um, which is looking at the non-detections, this 6,388 uh, normal early type galaxies, non-AGN, in the Cosmos survey. So what I'm showing you again is the data from the Chivan et al. paper, where in blue are the detection, here in red are the local group, um, local, sorry, the local universe calibrators. And here in big circles are the uh, points from the stacking, and uh, they're stacked in uh, uh, luminosity and redshift. And uh, uh, white means redshift less than 0.5, Gray is between 0.51 and black is greater than one. So these are the high redshift points, mid redshift points, low redshift points. So the first thing is that more or less they follow the uh, detections, uh, which is comforting, uh, maybe not surprising. Of course, you have more points in lower X-ray luminosities. We also have new points in these areas, which is uh, 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 very uh, smaller galaxies, getting to dwarf uh, galaxies. Um, another piece of information comes from the hardness ratios in these uh, 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 groups of galaxies that are bin in, uh, in each case, so in each detection bin. And this is plotted here, 
and by the way, this is just work in progress. Um, so clearly there are large uncertainties in the other equations, but we can look at trends. And uh, uh, a soft spectrum is a line that comes like this. Victorially hard spectrum is a line that points up. So what do you see here? Well, here by and large, you see lines going down. So this is the region where you expect the hot hellos, and they go well with the relation of the near universe. Um, but in this region, you see lines pointing up. So that suggests that the emission is not clearly not dominated by, um, by hot gas. Maybe AGNs are a solution. Also, you see lines going up. Things up at this point here are very are fairly high redshifts. Okay, so here is the summary. Um, uh, the, the first point I wanted to make it real very good data. Uh, we are, I think we can say with very good confidence that X-ray and kinematics mass measurement of, of mass profiles of elliptical galaxies are consistent, but there are some differences, and these comparisons, at least in the case of MGC 4649, <coughs> have shown a, a, something that could be a, an, the effect of radio feedback, and uh, which affects the uh, X-ray measurement. And in the, uh, the other radii, uh, the optical, there is a discrepancy between various measurements, which may be related to uh, non-random motion, not just uh, relaxed gravitational motions of the uh, markers that are used for these measurements. And this is based on our work on the global cluster population. The session in almost every galaxy features that are consistent with the infalling of satellites and merging. Uh, structure of the galaxy core galaxy versus uh, power law galaxies matters, but so does the evolutionary stage, a uh, younger galaxy or an older galaxy. In particular, in particular, if you have a core not rotating an old elliptical, um, they tend to be consistent with the realized uh, relation uh, for the gaseous halos out to at least redshift of 0.55. Uh, clearly, the cusp disk rotating ETGs do not, they're very low X ray emitters. The um, above the redshift of 0.5, underage, rejuvenated or underage uh, ETGs misbehave. And they definitely do not follow the near universe scaling relation, they're uh, over numerous in X rays once you take away the expected contribution of X ray binaries. And this could be in part to AGN shown by the hardness ratios, but also maybe by the effect of merging activity on their halos, which is also consistent with some of the merging simulations that have been done, for example, by Jeff Cox. Finally, hidden AGN may be common, and uh, they may be hiding in the high Z ETGs, the younger stellar ages. But maybe there is also this new population that we have seen of inefficient accretion AGNs in lower stellar mass ETGs that are suggested by the work that Alessandro has been doing, and expect a paper on that very soon. Um, I have a corollary since there is a moment left, I can use it. Um, and this is just I want to make the point that. The, uh, if we look at the future next generation X-ray telescopes, and you think about surveys that we can do between now and then, um, we'll be able to extend the scaling relations, and we should. But once we have them, we can also use them not just for measuring masses or trying to, <coughs> to study the structure of ATGs, because we have these relations, and if you have a gas temperature and you have uh, X-ray luminosity, and in principle, with a future survey, you should be able to do that. <coughs> if you find the galaxies in different uh, <coughs> regions of this diagram, you could say, okay, this is probably a CD, or this one <coughs> is a, a, a core elliptical. And uh, in principle, uh, this could be, this relation 
would be also useful to use ETGs as another cosmology problem in the future. So there is a room ahead <laughs> for what we can do uh, in X-rays. Thank you, Pepe. Questions? How do, you, how do you remove the LMX3 contribution? Because you can only do that cleanly for the most luminous one. Right. Um, and there are lots of low luminosity guys yeah, merging with the yeah, huge yeah, 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 absolutely. The, yeah. The, the, the point is that for the nearby uh, AGN, uh, sorry, nearby mm. galaxies, for the most luminous one, which needs down to 10 to the upper 36, you can get for some. You just remove them. Then you have luminosity functions that you can use to extrapolate back reasonably. And you know that there is, uh, for at least a couple of very nearby galaxies, we know what luminosity function does. Um, another uh, way you can do it is that the spectrum of uh, X ray binaries is very different from the spectrum of this hot interstellar medium. So you just do a special decomposition. And basically, this is all these three methods have been used in the paper by Borison and Don Wu and myself. And to get the scaling relations, once you've done that, we find that for those 33 galaxies, we have that the X-ray luminosity integrated map, X-ray luminosity of the um, binaries, is linearly correlated with a fairly well-established relationship with uh, the in, uh, integrated uh, uh, K-band luminosity, stellar luminosity. Okay. So then, if you believe that, you can use this relation and go where you cannot uh, detect the binaries and just apply it. And if you have enough spectral data, you can try to do a spectral decomposition. Okay. More questions? Actually, I have a question. So, when you showed the plot between uh, the, the X-ray luminosity, it will begin X-ray luminosity and total mass obtained from the planetary nebulae. So, the total yeah. planetary nebulae and global clusters is that mass which is obtained from planetary nebulae and global clusters consistent with X-ray estimates based on hydrostatic equilibrium? Yeah, that's what it should get. Mm -hmm. It's pretty well consistent. For one galaxy and for the other ones as well. Sorry. For the other ones as well. I mean, uh, in the previous plot, you showed quite a few galaxies based on the DSUN paper. Oh, yeah. So all but for those, we haven't done all of them. For, for those that DSUN have done the comparison, yeah, they're okay. reasonably consistent. Okay. Yeah. And then when one of the projects we want to do, and Romanowski is involved in, is trying to, they're, trying, they're, they're doing global cluster <laughs> masses, and uh, would be part of the work that also Don Wu and Collaborators are doing, looking at the archive, trying to get the X-ray masses and we do one by one comparison for a sizable number of galaxies. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Pepe.